Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Sonic Spaces. My name is Eve Patton, and I'm the director of the Trinity Long Room Hub, which is hosting this inspired new series on sound and the sonic environment. Uh, I hope that this evening's opening session will be a very pleasant break uh, for all of you from the noise of today's US election coverage. For those of you who come to our events regularly, and for those of you who might be new, let me first introduce the Trinity Long Room Hub, which is Trinity's Research Institute for the Arts and Humanities. It's where we coordinate the research work that's carried out across disciplines ranging from history and literature, music, film, drama, religion, philosophy, language. And our particular interest is in the interdisciplinary connections that go on between those subjects. And this new series is a perfect example, I think, of scholars and researchers from different fields coming together to produce fresh insights and new perspectives. Sonic Spaces is going to take you on a journey through the relationships of sound to technology, gender, the environment, uh, the world of literature, film, broadcasting, uh, and many other things. It was conceived and designed by our wonderful colleague, Dr. Jennifer O'Mara from the School of Creative Arts. And I'm very grateful to Jennifer for lending us her imagination and putting this brilliant idea to us. Do pass it on to other people. You can tweet using the handle at TLR Hub, and you can also use the hashtag Hub Matters, uh, and uh, that information should go up for you in the chat. The topic for this evening's discussion is soundscapes of the performing arts. Uh, we have an expert panel, and that will be introduced in a second and chaired by Professor Ruth Barton, who's head of the School of Creative Arts in Trinity. After you've heard from the speakers, there will be, I hope, a little time for questions from our audience, uh, and you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, but that's all from me. Let me wish the series very uh, best of luck as we launch it this evening, and I'll now hand over to Ruth Barton. Thank you very much, Eve, and welcome everybody to this evening's uh, discussion panel. Um, I have a very small role to play, um, and uh, I'm just going to start, therefore, by very quickly interview, uh, introducing the most important people in the room tonight, which is our speakers. Um, so our first speaker is Evangelia Rigaki. Um, Evangelia is head of music at Trinity, um, and she has a diverse uh, compositional portfolio, um, ranging from instrumental works to experimental music, theater, dance, performance art, installation, and opera. Her compositions are rooted in, in instrumental theater and experimental music theater. And she's collaborating closely with musicians, singers, and writers and poets. I, I know she's gonna be talking about some of her work with you this evening, and you're gonna be able to see a little bit of what she does, um, but selected recent projects include um, the installation opera, This Hostel Life, based on the book of the same name, uh, by Melatu Uche Okori uh, and, and performed by the Irish National Opera in 2019. And I had the great pleasure um, of seeing that. Also, um, While the World Misbehaves, The Baby Must Hide in the Beehive, uh, libretto by W.N. Herbert for six dancing percussionists, written for the 20th anniversary of Ryan's Percussion Ensemble in 2018. Um, Avon is currently working on a VR and AR opera in collaboration with the vSense team in TCD fully um, lockdown compatible, I imagine. Um, so um, Evangelia, uh, we look forward very much to hearing uh, what you're gonna talk about. Uh, thank you Ruth for the introduction and thank you very much uh, Jennifer for uh, inviting me to speak in this series. It's a great honor and thank you Eve for launching the series. So I was, I'm going to speak uh, briefly about uh, the installation opera I did with the, the Irish National Opera last September, This Host the Life, and just give a brief uh, synopsis what was this about. This was uh, based on the phenomenal book by Melato Uciocor, This Host the Life, that is basically a collection of three stories. And um, the idea was that uh, 
I present, uh, I did the libretto myself out of the uh, book of Melato. Melato gave me freedom and trust to do it. And um, see, I gave her drafts and she approved them later on. The idea was not to make abridged versions, but to create something else out of these stories. So I used extracts out of these stories and I didn't try to tell the story. I tried to present a moment out of these stories that was just standing on time. And uh, the idea was that um, this is, was called installation opera and not an opera because it didn't happen on a stage. It happened in the crypt of the Christ Church Cathedral. And the idea was that we had four performances happening at the same time and the audience would perceive all of them sonically and visually while moving. And somehow this would make sense. It would not be a cacophony. So the challenge was to combine four performances in an open uh, space that has a lot of uh, resonance and makes sense out of it and its audience to have a unique experience, each audience member. Of course, uh, the book of uh, Melatu is based on uh, direct provision issues. Not all of it, but two stories happen in direct provision center. Melatu herself is a heroic figure who has managed to survive direct provision life for eight years and managed to thrive through it, complete an MPhil at Trinity, now she's completing a PhD. She's been phenomenal how she managed to work through so difficult uh, circumstances. And uh, this kind of proximity of the experience with the performers being so close to the audience it was part of, you know, the concept that all this happened so close to us and yet, you know, we pass by, we, you know, we perceive it at our own pace, we ignore it. So the proximity and the tactile element of the performance was part of the concept of the piece that had to do with the direct provision. The hubs I created were quite modest because I wanted them to look fragile, so I didn't want an orchestral sound. However, uh, the percussion setup was quite extensive and the, it was three singers and a choir. The choir, if you wish, had almost the role of a Greek chorus and was reciting exactly extracts about direct provision. So, uh, was trying to emulate this kind of experience of being hypnotized and have a life repeated coming in and out. And this was on loop, the, the choir. They had a piece of 10, 15 minutes, depending on the tempo that was on loop. The other uh, three uh, groups of performers, they had three minutes, three pieces each that were lasting about 10 minutes each. So they have a material of half an hour, but the way the material were combined across the four hubs in the room was different all the time. So you will not hear synchronized the same three or four pieces at all times. You would hear different combinations. So the perception you would have as an audience in the room would shift. Somebody to experience all the music written would have to stay one hour in the room. Some people, that was not clear in the communication because it was promoted as, uh, you know, people can come and leave at any time, which was fine. But to experience all the, the work, you would have to stay one hour. If you would stay in this one hour, the pieces would keep sifting because of the different combinations of the materials that were happening across the rooms. And... Um, it was a great you know, privilege to do this uh, collaboration. I collab it was a great privilege to collaborate with Melatu, with the director, Katriona McLaughlin, Sarah Jane, who did the lightning and musicians and singers. Darkness and the immersive environment was uh, an important part of the experience and the sensory part, because you know, there were moments that the crypt was quite full 
and you would feel like you are watching the performance behind the backs of people, there were moments there were not so many people inside. And always the, you know, the audience walking, leaving, standing behind you, in front of you, almost elbowing you at some points. It was part of this suffocating experience that, you know, I imagine it could be, you know, being in the center of a direct provision. So, you know, I have uh, some photos I would like to show you from the night. And I think I reached my time limit. Yeah. yeah. This is Melatu. This is the crypt, and you can see the performances happening across the room. All the performers, they had a set of tabular bells that was the only connecting thread between them. So you could hear in the crypt at times, you know, bells ringing. So there were four sets of bells ringing, even the choir had a set of bells. This was not signifying the beginning and the end of the performance, it was scored in its piece. But somehow it also looks like uh, prison bars. So there was a symbolic element in that as well. Each performer had its own set of lights and at times the light was going off. So there was a complete uh, darkness. If you would like to change. We had to work also with the props of the crypt. The crypt is open for tourists. So we had the access to the room only for uh, one hour before the performance every night. So that's why you see some silver vitrines and posters explaining this was not part of the performance. Yep, if you can move. He was the, the tenor. He was accompanied with the bass clarinetist playing. These are the tabular bells he was playing. Yep. Yes, these were photos I did myself with my phone on the night. So, yeah. That's it, thank you very much. This is the choir. The choir would walk around the room at times, so they would be among the audience, in front of the audience, surrounding the audience. There were about 20 people, so they could really go across the rooms and bring the other performers together. And they were making body percussion, stomping their feet, singing, breathing, hammering. They, they had kind of improvised elements in their score as well. There they are walking around the space. Thank you. Thank you very much, Evangelia. And as I say, um, as somebody who attended the event, it was it was really stunning. And describing it doesn't doesn't do justice to the impact of being in the crypt and, and having all the and having sort of coming across all of these uh, sort of corners of performance. Um, so um, moving on then, I'd like to introduce Kevin Gleason, our second out of three speakers. Um, Kevin is, is a professional sound designer um, and composer for theatre and film. Um, in the past five years, he has designed and composed for theatre around Europe, um, predominantly with multi-award winning theatre company Dead Centre, um, as well as working with Kosh Kame, Liver Donoghue, Collapsing Horse and Fish Amble Theatre. Um, he's opened shows at Burg Theatre Vienna, uh, Schaubühne Berlin, the Gate Theatre and Abbey Theatre Dublin, as well as touring work to theatres in over 25 uh, countries, including BAM, New York, International Theatre Amsterdam, Hong Kong Cultural Centre, South Bank Centre and Alexandrins Alexandrinsky Theatre in St. Petersburg. Um, in 2016, um, he, his work on Chekhov's first play won Best Sound Design at the Irish Times Theatre Awards, um, and Kevin is a graduate of Trinity's MPhil in music and media technologies. So take it away, Kevin. Hi, yeah, so um, my name is Kevin Leeson and, um, and I'm a uh, sound designer and composer for theater. Um, I studied, um, uh, yeah, as, as you said, I studied uh, um, an MPhil in music and media technologies. Um, and uh, that's where I met uh, a guy called Jimmy Eady, um, who is a, a sound designer. Um, theatre for the last maybe 20 years in, in Dublin. Um, he was my lecturer 
um, and I always had a, an interest in, in um, I suppose, technology, um, the interactivity and um, multimedia art. Um, I'd never done theatre before, um, but uh, I ended up working with Jimmy on uh, on uh, Chekhov's first play in um, in 2016 um, in the Dublin Theatre Festival, um, which was my first show with the, the company Dead Centre, um, which I've been working with for the last five or so years. Um, and yeah, I think I've done six productions with them now. And yeah, I mean, Dead Center, um, they're a company, uh, they, they're very interested in, in kind of using all of the various kind of design tools um, available, um, kind of pushing technology to, 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 to I suppose, kind of uh, develop the form of theater. And, and yeah, technology, sound technologies, video technologies, stage technologies. Um, something that they're very interested in using and um yeah so i suppose um i'm going to talk a little bit about uh, i'm going to touch on Chekhov's first play maybe first and then i'm going to talk about uh, beckett's room which is a show that we did last year in the theater festival um both of these uh shows are headphone shows um so i'm i came prepared with my with my headphones <laughs> um so uh yeah I, we uh, Chekhov's first play is um, it's the version of um, Anton Chekhov's um, first play uh, uh, when he wrote when he was 19. Um, it is uh, a very long and very, uh, I suppose, naive. I mean, it's the beginning of his uh, of, of Chekhov's uh, career as a writer um, and, and dead center. Um, the, 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 the director, uh, Bushby Carswell, um, he, uh, ba so basically the, the premise of the show is that uh, he uh, gives a live director's commentary um, of the play as it is happening to kind of explain um, and g g give the audience um, insight that uh, in, into, into what's happening. Um, I, that's, that's the setup for the, for the show. Um, so, but but I mean, in in a way, it's it's just a setup so that we can um, uh, then um, uh, go. Apologies, we seem to have lost Kevin. We seem to have lost Kevin. So, um, uh, Kevin, can you hear us? Okay, so, um, I tell you what, uh, just as we pause and wait for Kevin to come back online, we actually have a question which has come in. So let's, um, let's go to that. Um, so it's Simon Sharkey, who says, was this before COVID restrictions? He's talking about Evangelia's performance. So Evangelia, you might answer that. And as we just wait and see if Kevin comes back, imagine how you might have done it under COVID. <laughs> well, yes, it's what a difference a year makes. Eh? That was really, I was saying to Fergus, I remember the artistic the director, that the closest you are to the performers, the better. And we shouldn't have, because of worse discussion, how we're going to, gu to guide the audience through this performance. If we are going to have uh, selected groups of audience coming in and out, if we are going to let them all in and just get congested. And I was thinking that, no, they have to experience this kind of, you know, closeness. So of course this couldn't happen anymore. So it was a sensory experience also by feeling, you know, audience bodies around you. <laughs> yeah, extraordinary, isn't it? What, what we can't, what, you know, it's unimaginable, the things that we can't do in a way. Um, I, I think that what we'll do everybody is given that we have, a, we have temporarily lost Kevin. Um, if you don't mind, Nick, we'll move on to our next speaker. Um, and you might fill in perhaps a little bit of the background to what you were doing with Kevin and, um, and, and we'll move on. And then maybe we can kind of draw Kevin back into the discussion again. So I'm just gonna introduce you, Nick, before we, um, before we go. Before we go. Um, so uh, uh, Nick Johnson is Associate Professor of Drama at Trinity College Dublin, and he's co-founder of the Trinity Center for Beckett Studies. Um, and within this, he co-directs the Beckett Summer School and the Samuel Beckett Laboratory. Uh, he directs, performs, and works as a dramaturg in a variety of theatre contexts in Ireland, uh, Germany, and in the UK. 
And as a dramaturg, he's a re regular collab collaborator with Pan Pan Theatre Company uh, and has worked with Dead Centre, the Dublin Youth Theatre and OT Platform. Um, his directing has appeared at venues such as the Samuel Beckett Theatre and Project Arts Centre in Dublin, the Lincoln Centre in New York, and the Lincoln Centre in New York. Um, and his 2017 to 19 project, that's two years if you're adding up, virtual play after Samuel Beckett, uh, created in collaboration with Vsense, won first prize at the New European Media Awards. Um, so Nick, I'm going to invite you then to step in. Oh, Kevin's back. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. My, I, I'm on my, I'm on, I'm on my phone broadband here, and my phone died. So sorry. yeah, nightmare. Um, <laughs> well, I, think what, um, I think we might. Uh, what would you two like to do, Nick and Kevin? Because I know that you're collaborators. Would it suit you both to go back to Kevin? Yeah, Kevin. I, I suppose you were. I think about to pivot to Beckett's room. Would you like to take that forward, and then I'll yeah. pick up where you left off, and we can we can do a double act now, uh, and I'll cover you if it happens again. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, so if you'd like to pick up, yeah, then. yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. Well, yeah. Beckett's room because, um, yeah, me, me and me and Nick were involved together on that show. Um, Beckett's room is a is a piece that was uh, on in the Theatre Festival uh, last year. Um, it's a it's a play with no actors. So, um, it's it, it's set in um, in Paris during the war um, in Samuel Beckett's apartment. Um, as he is writing his early works. Um, so what the audience experiences uh, is, I mean, they, they, they sit in uh, the Gate Theatre in Dublin um, at the time. Um, they watch a, 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 an empty apartment or a set. Um, uh, they hear actors, um, they hear sounds, they see objects moving on the stage, um, but there's no actors. Um, so this was achieved basically um, with, uh, with uh, there was the team of puppeteers um, operating a mechanical set, so there was four puppeteers positioned around um, the behind behind the set on stage, um, and then the you so you sit in the audience with a pair of headphones um, and you listen to uh, a soundscape of uh, which is a which is a performance of nine actors. Um, which was all recorded binaurally with a binaural microphone, uh, um, uh, along with uh, sound effects that were recorded binaurally. Um, and we basically tried to position using the, the, the binaural fields um, around the, 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 the person's head, um, the different uh, voices, the different sound effects and the music, um, which is then, um, played um, in sync with the movements of this mechanical set, basically. So it's, it's actually much harder to explain than, <laughs> than it is to just experience. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, we, uh, we worked on, on this last year and um, yeah, I suppose the, the, the process of it was, uh, it started off with uh, Bush uh, McCarsel, the, the director came to me. I mean, I think we were working on it for more than two or three years, um, we, um, you know, he came to me with this idea that can, can we do a, um, a show that has no actors in it, basically, um, but almost like ghosts, so that you experience people on the stage. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, we, we initially, as a, from a sound point of view, was, we, you know, the big, the big challenge here was, um, I suppose the thing you miss without a person being there is the uh, is the visual um, cues that you would get from seeing them on stage, um, looking at their expressions, um, seeing their movements, the specialization of 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 these people. Um, so we had to try and I suppose um, replace this uh, all of this juiciness that you get when you sit in a theater and you watch a uh, an actor perform with various things, uh, moving objects, so stagecraft, um, sound. So how do we how do we make the sound do the things that the actors would normally do? How do we get them to be over there or be over there on the stage? How do we get them to move across the stage? Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it, it becomes very difficult, you know, obviously the, the performer can't be there. Um, so how do we put them there? 
Um, so initially we tried um, some like multi-channel um, solutions with various speakers placed across the stage area. Um, and uh, in, in a small venue, in a, in a, in a small um, theater space where the audience is right um, on top of, of, of the setting, it, it can work in a kind of in installation, interactive installation sense um, that you play a sound from that speaker um, beside the kettle and that uh, the sound of the kettle boiling and then and then the brain and then you see steam coming from the kettle uh, then you might say that that kettle is actually um, is boiling and and it was a similar approach with the actors I mean if we put a if we put a, an actor at this at the door here when we play a, a recording from from that speaker um, then in, in a sense that that person is there um, but it becomes very limited when you move into a big space like the Gate Theatre or, or any or any large theatre that you know once you once you kind of move up yourself spatially. I mean, people in the back row of the theatre, um, you you may as well not really experience any of that spatialization because it's it's so focused um, on the stage. Um, and and you know we need we need to kind of keep the you know replace the intrigue of of the physical being with some other method um, so I mean essentially what this our solution became and, and we did use headphone technology before on on uh, other productions um, and and binaural technology you know we had we had um, we had uh, explored binaural, binaural technology and um, I mean if, if anybody is unfamiliar binaural technology is it's specifically for headphones you use a special microphone which looks like a, a human head basically um, which replicates the, the the physiology of of how the ears listen so it's 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 a it's a two channel system uh, i suppose it's the sonic equivalent of um, 3d glasses in, in a sense um, but um, I mean, on, you, might, you might be familiar on YouTube with something called ASMR, which um, I suppose uses this, uh, this uh, uh, I suppose, uncanny effect of, of hearing sounds placed with outside of the head and, and ha that have a spatial aspect. Um, so we, it, it, beca it became clear that this was kind of the obvious technology that we should explore for, um, for this show. Um, so I mean, in theory, we you know we thought about if you put the microphone in the first row of the the audience in the, in the gate theater, and you have the actors perform across the stage, so that they move in from you know line to line, and they run and they interact and they you know they they make uh, they, they they gesture and they breathe and they have footsteps and they you know. Um, it, the, th the initial theory was that if you did that and then and then you take the actor away and you play back with in this specialized uh, system that we were using that you could almost replace the um, all of the all of the different uh, clues all the all of the different uh, sonic clues to to give the impression that yeah that this is it, this is happening um, but uh, yeah you know once once you move away from the stage again yeah you lose the I mean, you know, because the reality is, if you sit in the in a theater and you look at the stage, you just hear it all come from over there, um, and that doesn't matter in a normal theater production because um, uh, basically um, you see that you see people moving, and you see, you know you have the joy of the actors. So there was a there was a real job for the sound in this show to provide a lot of the 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 meat of 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 um, of of, of um, intrigue and of um so so basically what we decided to do is to shrink down the the entire uh, stage setting uh into its tiny area around the binaural head in the proximity of maybe like one meter um so the the set was a duplex apartment so four rooms uh, at two or four heights so one two three four bedroom bathroom uh uh, bed, uh, sitting room, kitchen. Let's say, um, and we 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 mapped out. We had it. We had a, a like a diagram built on the floor in front of the microphone, and and then we had all of the actors basically act within this tiny, tiny stage that was that that was set up around the head. Um, so they would speak a line, and maybe and maybe move um, very very slightly, and then later in the post production, 
what we would do is we would uh, we would add footsteps, uh, binaural footsteps in between those locations and, and, and all of the sound effects that that we would need to, to make this holistic thing happen. And then on the on the stagecraft side of things, um, a team of four puppeteers with um, Andrew Clancy um, as the set designer designed this uh, like doll's house of of um, strings and wires and pulleys and levers, um, so that you know the door would open. Uh, you'd hear a sound, the sound of a, a door opening in that location. Um, you'd hear a voice speaking, um, and then you would hear the voice speaking while moving across the stage with the footsteps. Um, you would see them pick up a cup. A cup would 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 lift. You would hear the sound, um, and then the, the cup would move, would move with the voice. They might take a sip. The cup would come up for a sip, and this was this was basically how we did the entire show, which is a very very complicated process. Um, but yeah, the effect is that you you sit in um, in the theater and you watch a show for an hour and a half with nine per performers, uh, or not nine performers, nine 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 characters. Um, um, but there's nobody on stage ever, um, and and yeah, this uh, you know this it was it was a, it was a very complicated process to to achieve it. Um, we I had um, Jenny O'Malley was assisting on the show, and she was also the operator. Um, so she was operating sound for the show, and and the, and the operation of the show actually was an incredibly complicated process as, um, as well because the four puppeteers at, around the set. Um, had to be in perfectly in sync with Jenny, who would press go on on the sound cues. So, with, with the theatre show, it all has to happen in steps, in cues, in stages. Um, you can't just press play. Um, you know, everything has to happen at the right time. And in this show, every basically every every line, every sound effect, every piece of music had to have a go. Um, that would happen exactly in sync with what was happening on, on stage with the puppeteers. Um, so I think there was like usually in a theater show, you might have a hundred sound cues in the show. I think Jenny had 700 in, in, in one show and sometimes she'd have 50 and 50 sound cues in, uh, in, in, in one minute. Um, Cause she'd have to, she'd look at the stage, she'd, she'd see something happen. She, something would move, she'd hit go. And then every, every time, every time, anything happened on stage uh, it um it involved a lot of work basically um so um yeah i mean it's i think it's an example of um it's an example of the type of work that dead center do um you know they're they're always trying to do uh to do something new and something that has never been done before and you know to use technologies in this way um so yeah, I think Nick is Nick, is, who's going to speak after me, was also involved as the dramaturg for this show. So um, I'm I'm, I'm going to pass it over to Nick now, and, and and I'm sure he'll probably have some something to say um, about about that process. Um, but yeah, thank you, thank you very much also for for inviting me, and um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. That's fantastic. Um, uh, I wish I was there. Um, so Nick, uh, over to you. Thanks, thanks so much, Ruth, and thanks, Kevin, uh, and thank you to Jennifer, and thank you to Eve uh, for, for organizing. This has um, been a fascinating uh, panel to be a part of because I, I saw my role here, again, typical of a dramaturg, um, to sort of lay some groundwork or some context around the ecology or the system in which this is all happening. And I think there are kind of three systems that I would call our attention to. So the, the first of these is really just the, the technological affordances, the fact that this is possible at all has to do with a shift that's unfolded in wider culture, but particularly in theater making and, and creative arts and creative technologies of really the shift from analog to digital. And the thing that made Beckett's room quite interesting um, is that Beckett is kind of famously, and it's almost a truism of talking about Beckett, you know, he was an intermedial artist himself. He took on radio plays from the mid 1950s and began to evolve a practice that was sort of started as poetry, moved through to fiction, moved into the theater, and then gradually over the last 20 and 30 years of his life, um, began to experiment across different media and was involved in radio, television, and film. And there has been sort of underpinning the experimental work that's been unfolding with Beckett 
research in general, both at Trinity and, and in the wider uh, Beckett Studies ecosystem, that um, th there's been a fascination to think that if Beckett were still with us after 1989, he would have been very interested in aspects of the new technologies. So what is the Beckettian idea um, of theater or the pushing to the limits of theater or subtracting the elements of theater to see what was still available to us um, on the internet or on a VR headset or on AR headsets that each new technology there would be this question about the ontology of that medium you know what is the what is the meaning of that medium and how can we sort of break down that question and so I think the interesting thing with Beckett's room is it, it tried to apply a Beckettian question which is you know what is theater minus theater what is theater minus the actor um, what remains when you have that and and putting a lot of pressure on technologies of performance but particularly sound more than almost any other to ask the question, you know, how do we tell stories? How do we affect thought? How do we intervene in conversations um, in that environment with, with that way? So I think that that wider scope of the century is one of the questions that hopefully this whole sonic series will develop, you know, from as we think about what was it to move from the tape reel, the reel to reel that we associate in Beckett with Craps Less Tape, um, again from the 1950s, right around the time that he's working on, on radio plays for the first time, he gets interested in this medium. But he obviously before then already had an ear for music, was already evolving an awareness of sound and rhythm and material, and then the ability to control that and change that and have multiple voices playing at the same time in a space became a dramaturgical principle that he played with over the course of the century. So as we as we try to resonate with that question now and we ask the question of what is contemporary theater going to do with that, how do we continue to evolve and continue to develop, I think we have to be as radical as he was in those works and in that century to say what happens if we subtract elements that we think are constitutive of performance um, what is left and, and what does that what does that element do so for that kind of raw research question um, the trinity ecosystem has set up over the last 10 years really out of, out of a lot of prior work with beckett scholars who worked here um, anna mcmullen i'm thinking um, uh, who uh, who left the community um, to take the next job in 2006 but who um, would have been sort of one of the founding thinkers in the drama department of our MPhil, and then gradually um, handed over to a figure like matthew causey who was my phd supervisor who worked at, um, at the ATRL, the Arts Technology Research Laboratory, where we had a high quality recording studio and a digital performance space. And that was where with uh, funding from the Provost Fund for Visual and Performing Arts um, and the Creative Challenge, we did the first experiments with this play, um, as Kevin said, I think back in 2017. And right around those experiments in that center with those resources, um, we were asking other questions between ATRL and, and, and this space um, with other thinkers from MMT. So that was the, the, the work with Pan Pan's radio plays uh, where Jimmy Eady was still sound designing and I was working as dramaturg for them. And then um, our experiments with Intermedial Play and vSense began around that time. And so there is an interesting cluster if we, if we look back at the 2010s, you know, this kind of 10 year period, there is an enormous amount of interest and pressure on creative technologies as they apply to Beckett, and that there is a community of artists who are working and thinking around these issues um, in the 2010s in this period and in this particular place, and that it then goes on to infuse practice in other dimensions, other spaces. Um, and because we have a platform with the Beckett Laboratory and the, and the summer school, we've been able to invite a lot of other artists who are fall outside of this, this, this realm um, or who are not directly associated with uh, with Trinity, you know, per se, but who do present work there or speak about that work. And I'm thinking in particular uh, of the sound designer Mel Mercier's work and how it is with Garcin Lazar, um, which was part of the 2019 summer school. So I suppose what I'd like to do really is get the audience excited about the um, the dynamics of experimentation and to realize that that these technologies and the affordances are still really changing Beckett. That there is a kind of liquid space of things that were 20th century uh, avant-garde and critical that the, the fusion of practices, research, professional theater connections and a university can actually speak to one another effectively and that the resources of one can feed into the other and that this kind of mingling of interdisciplinary knowledge can cross the bridge between uh, the community which is 
rooted in the questions of research or publication or fundamental experimentation with Beckett, you know, not for uh, public consumption at a festival, and that then that ecology will feed the work that then goes into these international theaters or goes on international tours. And so I, I suppose I want to, um, to, to, to end on that thought, the possibility that, that a university that is a bridge and that is porous between people who study and then go into the discipline, people who work in the discipline and come back, and then all the hybrid beings in between, like, like myself or like a dramaturg, um, are, are able to contribute on both sides. We're able to develop new research ideas and new questions, but also to sort of change the shape of theater and what that's doing. And I, I think that's very much in line with um, the legacy of a radical thinker um, like Beckett and, and to realize that um, Trinity is still a vibrant space for that kind of experimentation. And that even a very specific medium aware detailed and concrete thinker and writer like Beckett um, has a lot to offer that remains experimental. And, and so I suppose I'd, I, I, might, I might leave it there for now and, and let the rest emerge through questions or through dialogue between the panel. Um, but if, um, if, if any of those aspects sort of uh, help to frame our, our ecosystem, I think that would be a useful, uh, a useful thought to carry forward. Fantastic, um, Nick, thank you so much. And thank you to the other panelists. And we have questions. So I think we'll start with the questions. Um, and Nick, just stay right where you are because the first okay. one I think is really for you. It's from Maria Ristani and her question is, was uh, Beckett's breath with its no actor space an inspiration perhaps for Beckett's room? Hi, Maria. I know Maria. Um, she's come to the summer school before. Um, so uh, yes, I, I think that there, we were we were thinking in the de, in the development of this idea, um, and and I would want to highlight I suppose the the company um, Bush McCarzel and Ben Kidd working in tandem as as co-directors with the project, um, with Kevin and Andrew on very early on in the process. Um, a lot of the drive, the Google Drive that I um, that I populated in um, in in the dramaturgical support for this we wrote a lot about the philosophy of absence, the philosophy of the void, and asking the question about how do we, um, in a sense, affect the viewer or affect another with uh, the idea of absence. You know, where is absence the most powerful? And this has a lot of links in all kinds of questions about neuroscience, about pedagogy. There, it crosses over with many, many fields, this idea of absence or void. And so I think it's a it's a provocative idea to think that Beckett did already you know create stage uh, stage productions that didn't have actors and that did have voices and that would have implied uh, a recording or a, a, a kind of underpinning life of a recorded voice um, and breath definitely contains that and there are numerous works across the the canon of uh, 20th and 21st century art that engage with that so I'm, I'm thinking also of the tape loops. Uh, that were worked on in the avant-garde in uh, New York in the 70s, um, the work of Richard Foreman, for example, and then Laurie Anderson uh, more recently um, experimenting and the, the work that she's presented here at IMA, and people who play with the analog technologies in order to create these multiplicities and to have a sort of uh, self continuing technological performances. So Breath is a really interesting uh, text that I would love to go back to and I would love to consider you know, are there ways to stage that in galleries? Are there ways to stage that in uh, the, the virtual reality media or augmented reality media? And I think we're not done with a text like that. So um, it's quite an important link. And it is one of the things um, that we did think about in terms of uh, where in the canon of Beckett had he dealt with absence in a really serious way. Okay, thank you very much. The questions are actually flying in. So we're gonna move on and I'm, trying, I'm gonna to try to kind of disperse them around the, the panel. I'm going to start off just to encourage you all with a comment from uh, Gabriel McGovern, who says, just wish to let you know that I'm finding this event fascinating and so, so interesting. So uh, good for you, panel. Um, if I did emojis, I would right now. So um, we have a question. I am skipping around a little bit. Um, so uh, I'm going to, uh, we've got a question here for Kevin. Um, Kevin, what effect do you, this is from Tom Lane. What effect do you think headphones have on the live communal communal experience of theater? Do they make the group experience more isolated, perhaps more similar to the individual remote theater experiences we are now more used to, like in your recent piece, To Be a Machine, for example, thank you. So Kevin, can I uh, invite you to respond? Yeah, to yeah, I think that's definitely true. Um, yeah, I mean, um, to, I mean, the, the, I think 
in general, the, the act of wearing headphones is a very isolating experience, you know, to hear. And it's also a very unnatural experience to, to hear inside your own head almost. You know, if you listen to a voice uh, in mono played through headphones, um, it, it effectively is located within your head, which is something that's, you know, is, 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 is I suppose, new in, 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 in you know, in, in terms of it's, it's not, it's not something that's, uh, it's only been around, um, you know, a hundred years or something, the idea of um, binaural technology and, and, um, and yeah, I mean, even um, we noticed in the theatre, um, the reactions of the audience, um, particularly with Chekhov's, Chekhov's first play, um, we'd have moments um, where, you because know, we would have, you know, we'd have 100, 200, 300, human beings on headphones all listening to the same thing and experiencing the same thing and, and actually hearing the exact same thing you know that they, they, they're all they're all getting the same feed they're all hearing the actor in their head they're all hearing the you know everything is happening very very in a, in a very close way and um yeah i mean there, there's moments of like eerie silence in in the theater um it's very interesting to observe it without headphones and just and just watch the audience of people with headphones um there's moments of 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 of, of eerie eerie silence where everybody is is very much immersed in their own world and then um and and, and also kind of um in in the opposite way then people are, are actually um they almost forget that they're in a theater and 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 sometimes express themselves um vocally um in the same way you know um you speak very loudly when you have headphones on um some people laugh some people uh speak to their friend very loudly you know i mean there's 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 a very very different and unique energy i find that, um to to the headphone experience i think um that is very interesting and, and yeah i suppose the yeah, our experiences now with live performance um, streams and, and 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 you know we and and, and like 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 me now listening um, to you um, with headphones, you know, it, it is a very different experience to the to the normal sonic experience that we we would um, we would know from the theatre. Um, and I think actually, in some ways, the, the that aspect of the headphone technology is more useful and more there's more uh, intrigue. In, in the in the act of being in this enclosed world than the nuances of binaural of you know this sound moves across here in this way actually just putting on a pair of headphones and shutting out the the world is is actually more effective um a, a tool than um than than yeah than the nuances of 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 of, of the left right or the you know uh the kind of the more um gimmicky aspects of, 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 of binaural. So, so yeah, I would definitely agree with, with that statement, yeah. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Um, questions are still flying in and we have 10 minutes. So mm -hmm. what we have is actually a question from, I'm gonna pronounce this wrong, Dimitriana Kondaraci, sorry, Dimitriana, um, from uh, the George uh, Enescu National University of Arts in IAC Romania. But um, you're asking where you can see the play or a fragment and I think I would say the same thing to Evangelia. Is is it possible to, do you have online links that maybe we could post after the event to your performances, but uh, all of you? Uh, anybody can answer, feel free. Kevin, you're on, you're, I'm uh, looking uh, at you. <laughs> Evangelia's, Evangelia's appeared. So let's, let's, let's go to Evangelia. I don't think there is a, an online link yet available, but should there be one I can disseminate it? Fantastic, thank you very much. And Kevin and Nick, is there an online? Is there an online available? Because I know people are going to want it. Um, I mean, the the, the theatre shows that I do are in the past. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, uh, my, if you look at my website, there, there would be links to, to some of my my work, but um, and and for the moment, there isn't much happening. So uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, I, I do know that the theater company uh, Dead Center does self archive so there there would yeah. be you know archival copies that are there for research. Um, there are usually yeah. uh, difficult issues with theater streaming uh, around rights and so um, the the rights of the authors and makers and and creators um, do have to be maintained so generally it wouldn't be public uh, public public but certainly for people researching this or interested in that I think it's a good idea to get in touch with the company or get in touch with with us and we can do do our best to direct you 
Okay, um, thanks everybody very much. So we have a, a specific question. This one is um, I, from Glenda Chimino. Um, I saw Beckett's room at the gate and thought it was brilliant, far better than the description in the program. I do think the visual element of the set, the historical setting and the movement of objects was both fascinating and necessary. Um, otherwise you have a radio play. I especially like the reflections of people in the mirror, the only sign of physical presence. I wonder why you decided to have this visual element absence can be a kind of presence. So there's a challenge to the creative genius behind this work who's going to um, respond, I think. Well, there were many, uh, many hands on this deck. So um, all that I would, would want to say about it is that um, one of the most exciting things about Beckett's room was that I did get to, um, with the benefit and help uh, of my assistant dramaturg and translator uh, and PhD student, Céline Taubois, um, we did make contact after years of trying with the current residents of Beckett's actual apartment in um, the seventh floor of Rue de Favorite uh, in, um, in Paris, and that we successfully entered and toured that apartment and captured uh, images that informed the design. And so we, we have material about the actual room. It was not, um, there was a dramaturgical investigation here. It was a detective story, um, which I think we'll still have to write more about, which um, it took years to get in, but we did actually um, go there to, to Paris and, and capture the space. So there were, along that side, there were lots of discussions around what is the visual, how do we represent that visual culture? Can we just lift that room as it was. Of course, the records are not very good for exactly what the structure was. The structure is the same, but the interior design, the room, the development, you know, would have changed since the 1930s. Um, so I think the, 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 the real answer to your question is that we did find that the audio would become quite dead if nothing was happening, you know, for a long period of time. And so the use of not just the puppetry and smoke and light, but also shadow, and then the idea that we enjoyed the idea that if one person uh, you know, is moving and we don't see it, but we see a shadow or we see a, a brief reflection that suggests a kind of life and, and vivifies the scene um, where otherwise you're kind of dealing with quite an absence uh, the whole time. So um, Kevin, you may want to say anything else about that, but I think- Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, like you say, it, it was, it was um, it's just about kind of maintaining the level of attention that uh, people need in 2019 <laughs> when they go to the theater, you know, like, uh, and, you know, there's nobody there. There's no actors to look at. And yeah, like, as I said before, you know, it was all about like, how can we push everything that isn't the actors to make it feel like there, there, there is people there, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it was another, it was another tool in the, in the, in the, in the chest to, to keep the, the intrigue in a show that is an hour and a half long and doesn't have actors in it. Um, I think that's kind of the, the easiest way. I mean, yeah, it, 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 maybe it would have been better to, to not have them, but we did it. <laughs> okay, thank you both very much. Um, we've got a question, uh, it's a comment and a question that I'm going to throw open to all of you. Initially, it looks more difficult to answer than it is. So um, it's from Ashling Murray who says, Really loving this conversation. How can a university open up the research further to potentially interested collaborators beyond those that may have already come through the university? And I think this does um, perhaps, um, although it does sound general, I think there is, a, there is something that you can all respond to in this, which is in part, where do you go with your work? Um, you know, do you see yourselves, in part it's what was, Nick was saying about this is work that, that is very specifically located within a university and intellectual environment, but at the same time you're opening out to the public and, and Evangelia's work very, very evidently does this too. Um, and where do, I suppose in part it's where do you see yourselves in the future um, and how do you straddle that gap and pull in people who um, perhaps are not of the university uh, community or, or it's a long time ago, so how do you make that work engaging and collaborative uh, down the line? Um, maybe I'll, um, if it's not too difficult to sort of pounce on you, Evangelia, um, maybe I'll pounce on you and say, you know, where's it going for you? Yes, for me, I try in every work I do to have research questions and try to get uh, some uh, research going on and try to do something that hopefully, you know, or in a way it hasn't been done before. So I, I do think my compositions as research. However, I do also think them as, you know, as written for an audience and disseminated to an audience, not uh, through a publication. 
So for me, it does go to a public domain. It does have to be experienced. So it is, you know, a work of theater or music theater or, you know, music. And, and could, and do people come to you, Evangelia? I mean, do people just like sort of, you know, email you and say, I've got this fantastic idea or could they? Of course they could. And usually when they have a fantastic idea, they want to do a PhD or a master's about it. <laughs> but well, I mean, anyway, I can for that. Yeah, okay. So, and, and I mean, just to people listening to this, all our speakers, well, certainly our academic speakers, um, their emails are available on the website and I'm sure there's a link to Kevin as well. So if you do want to ask some questions that we haven't had time to um, cover in this talk, I think, you know, you'll, you'll be able to do so by, by, by going on our websites. Um, but maybe Nick, um, uh, I can invite you to come in on this. Yes, I, I, I suppose I, I take the question in, in two ways because I think um, it, the, the goal of my work, I think, has gradually become more the integration of artistic practice and research, both in myself, in terms of how I think of myself, and in terms of the institution. So in trying to contribute to opportunities within the institution, but also in my own work, where these uh, borderlines become quite muddy or quite porous or quite unclear is really a strategic position that I try to inhabit, you know, to say that as a researcher, I am doing embodied work. And sometimes that expresses itself in a theater, in a professional context, other times in publication or through a book. But all of that is me, you know, I mean, I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking and living through my work uh, in, in both contexts. And even as a teacher, um, I found a lot of coincidence in the pedagogical environment with what I then carry into, you know, research or writing. So I'm, I'm not very interested actually in the hard lines and the hard divisions. I do at the same time realize that that's a position of privilege. That's a position that, that I, am, uh, I, I am kind of gifted with through my access to this institution, my comfort within it, my having been trained and opened, you know, those spaces were opened for me by others. Um, and so in a way, I think we have a debt actually and a responsibility as people who inhabit this space to lower those drawbridges, to break down those barriers, you know, break down those fences that are around this university for historical reasons and sort of say, we are in the community, we exist in the community, and perhaps um, a slight bright spot in COVID is that it is easier right now to reach out across that, that border, and it's easier to link up with someone you know, in Romania or Germany or Greece who maybe didn't previously um, have access to these sessions because we're reaching out so much. So I think we should use the digital platforms if we can to demystify university life and to not make people feel like they have to walk through those heavy gates and pass security to do it, but that they can log on, think about this, engage, and then engage in their own way. So I, I do not really like the distinction language between uh, artistic and university practice, because I think we're, we're all in this embodied investigation of what it is to be in the world now. And final word, Kevin, I'm gonna offer you, because you've actually, you're, you straddle both. You straddle both um, academic uh, work and, you, and commercial work. So you have to make mm -hmm. a living and you also have to, you know, you wanna do this. So how does that work for you? Um, it, like in terms of um, work that I've been doing, yeah, like I've been working pretty extensively with Dead Center for the last five years, and I've been lucky. Um, you know, it's a it's a small pool of work that it, that exists in 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 a commercial sense in in Ireland and even abroad. Um, and I've been lucky enough to be working very consistently with Dead Center and. Um, um, but yeah, I know. I, I, but I, but I, but I do. I do think there is definitely um, there is potential for more communication between the you know the institutions and the 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 you know the people practicing out in the in the you know in in the in the commercial in a commercial sense you know for sure. Um, yeah, it's definitely an interesting thing. You know, like Nick says, like the the, the opportunities are there now, especially um, to do these types of things. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well. Look that was fabulous. Um, we have a stack of questions that we don't have time to get to. So it's a real credit to our three speakers that we've um, that uh, people are just dying to ask you more questions. Um, so um, I'm going to uh, wrap up by um, thanking you all very much. Um, we could put on lots of clapping hand emojis, but um, uh, <laughs> even <laughs> actually, it's, it's beyond me. I'm not going to. Everybody else can. Um, but I think I'm not certain if we archive this chat, but it would be fantastic to, to be able to do so if we can. 
Um, and, but I'd particularly like to uh, finish up uh, by thanking Jennifer O'Mara for organizing this series. There will be more, so come back for it. Um, I'd like to thank Eve and the Hub for hosting it. Francesca, who's always in the background and makes the thing run smoothly, and of course our panelists. Um, so from us, uh, good night, put on your speakers, listen to whatever you're going to listen to, and we look forward to seeing you uh, at the next session. Thank you very much. <laughs>